Okay. So before we begin this training, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that with many of us based in or near Salt Lake City, we are on the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute people. And I want to pay my respect to indigenous elders, both past and present. Um, and I also recognize that a statement like this can only be meaningful when it is coupled with um, with meaningful interaction with indigenous communities. So as we find ourselves on the landscape for this project, we just want to invite each of us to do what we can to immerse ourselves in the histories and current realities of local indigenous groups. So to start, you can simply check what land you're on. I think that's a great start. Um, there's a wonderful app called Native Land, a lot of other resources as well. I just wanted to start with that. And then kind of on a similar vein, um, we just want to note that Wild Utah Project and partners on this project really value the diverse perspectives that each of you, as well as our staff and other partners all bring to this project and to the work. So we just wanted to point out our diversity, equity and inclusion policy, which is outlined on our website. So essentially we just ask and expect that each volunteer staff partner treat each other with respect. Um, so if you have any questions or you notice something that you'd like to talk about, please do not hesitate to reach out to me or to any of us on the team and we'd be happy to talk with you. And then just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I know that we're all probably pretty familiar with Zoom by now, <laughs> but um, you are all currently um, muted and I'm not able to share your screen just to ensure a good connectivity for this session. So note that you'll be able to turn on your video and, and unmute yourself during the Q&A sessions. We'll have two Q&A sessions. So just keep yourself, your questions for then, or you are free to um, add them in the chat as you think of them through the presentation and we will just address them during the Q&A sessions. Um, and I will also be sharing um, links every once in a while in the chat box. So if you locate that, it's just at the bottom of your screen and you're able to just open and type and see what's going on. Um, and then let's see. So yeah, that, that covers our, uh, our housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, just message me directly and I can help you. I'll be kind of doing the background stuff while we have our presentation going. And then for a quick... Uh, agenda overview. We will be starting with some of the background and description of what the project actually is. Um, and then we will have a Q&A and a break. And then we'll move into part two of, of our presentation, which um, folks who have participated previously are welcome to hop off after session one. Um, our second part will focus on field survey protocols, which um, yeah, yeah, you're welcome to stay for a review as well, but if you would like to hop off, you're welcome to, and then we will have another Q&A session. So again, welcome, and yes, please just feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, and it is my honor to introduce Kaylee Mullen, who is the Utah Conservation Program Supervisor with the Hogle Zoo and a toad expert. Um, we'll also hear from Mary Pendergast, who is an ecologist and conservation biologist at Wild Utah Project and also an expert of all things amphibians and reptiles. So just very excited to hear from both of these women. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. I wish we were all together in person, as has been my wish for over a year now. But there is light at the end of the tunnel, and I'll get to see you all this year, which I'm really excited about. Uh, so let's just dive right in. And I'm actually just going to start by introducing myself. I always get ahead of myself. But I'm Kaylee Mullen. I'm the Utah Conservation Program Supervisor here at Hobel Zoo. I have been here four years next week, which somehow is just flown by. And I just love it here. And I love the toad program. And I love getting to meet people who also love toads. So it's just been really four years of a dream. And I'd like to introduce Mary as well before we 
dive fully into it and she can talk a little about World Utah Project. We have been partnering together on this program for five plus years now and it just highlights the importance of partnerships and conservation work like this because we couldn't be where we are today without World Utah Project and some of our other partners who I will talk about in a little bit. Thank you so much, Kaylee, and welcome to all of our return participants. I see a lot of familiar uh, names on the attendance list and welcome to folks who this is maybe their first year thinking about boreal toad conservation. Um, so yeah, as Kaylee said, Mary Pendergast, ecologist at Wild Utah Project, um, just really briefly, our mission is to bring science in service of wildlife conservation. So a lot of what we do is focused on filling data gaps, gathering data, producing maps, and providing literature support to conservation partners as well as state and federal agencies and municipalities. Um, a lot of times our, our niche really is helping get um, pretty fundamental information about habitat, habitat condition, location, where species are distributed, so that the most up-to-date information can be used by those um, habitat managers and conservation planners. Um, and oftentimes these projects do lend themselves to community science. So if we can put together, along with our academic partners, a robust protocol that is used also by the decision makers, the managers at the state and the federal agencies um, that can be, um, transferred into a training program for community science scientists like you all, it is really powerful. It allows us to work on a large landscape scale and get data um, in a really timely fashion so that those managers have that information that they might not otherwise be able to get in such a timely fashion. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Mary. All right, I'll talk a little about Hogel Zoo. I'm hoping most of you here today know of the zoo, have been to the zoo, are a big fan of the zoo. Uh, if you know us, you know that we're really focused on some kind of four core principles, those being animal welfare, education, conservation, and recreation here on grounds in our gardens and looking at what we have here at the zoo. Under this umbrella, these four core principles, we have so many programs, so many conservation programs, both internationally and right here in our own backyard. One of those being boreal toad conservation. And this is kind of a multi-pronged approach to saving a species. We have our boreal toad conservation center here on grounds, but we have a um, kind of an insurance pop population. And these toads we've taken as eggs from the wild. And we're really trying to create a safe space for them, along with other zoos and aquariums, which I'm excited to talk more about too. I know some of you are here today. And we're creating this breeding program so we can ensure that these toads are not gonna go extinct in the wild. We are introducing tadpoles year after year throughout our partnership with other zoos. And secondly is our community science program. This is the zoo's largest community science program to date. And it is, just built on the backbone of you guys, like you have created this program, you've made it what it is. And we work so closely with the Division of Wildlife Resources, US Fish and Wildlife Service, US Forest Service, and all of our data that you are collecting is going back to these agencies. And you're really helping kind of make decisions regarding the species that are, is found in your public lands. This is your native species. So it's just a really, great program and it's great having you here helping save animals that are native to Utah. Um, so this is our ninth year working with the boreal toad. Uh, as I said, I've only been here for four years, so I've kind of seen it grow and it's just been um, awesome to see people keep coming back year after year, especially, and new people too, everyone. So I spoke a little about our partners and one of our major partners is the Department of Natural Resources. And they kind of umbrella different divisions, including the Division of Wildlife Resources and the Utah Geological Society. And we really couldn't do a lot of this work without guidance from them. 
where we go really does depend on year after year of data collected by the DWR and kind of collated and made into these beautiful maps by the UGS. And the DNR also distributes funds that help prevent species getting to the point where they need to be on the endangered species list. And that is the ESMF here, the Endangered Species Mitigation Fund. And World Utah Project and the zoo are grateful and lucky to receive some funding. Most of the years that we've done this to really help push this cause forward. So we're very thankful for these partnerships. And I spoke about the zoos who are also included in this kind of insurance colony that we have, that we've taken these eggs and we've raised them into these beautiful, healthy toads. So we have ourselves, Hogel Zoo, Denver Zoo is part of this program, Omaha Zoo, and a special shout out to Lovely Living Planet Aquarium. I know a ton of staff from there are here joining us today, and you guys are planning to come out and do surveys with us this year. So shout out to the aquarium. We're glad to have you here. Oh, also uh, big news, both the aquarium and the zoo have got eggs from these very um, kind of fickle species this year. So big successes here in Salt Lake City, very exciting news. And we hope to be releasing tadpoles back into the wild this year, pretty cool. So we've laid the base of today. And I think now we're just gonna dive right in to amphibians, who they are, why we need to care about them. We'll narrow it down to North America, down to boreal toads, what is currently being done and how all of you guys can help is the star of the show. So let's start with just the basics. What is an amphibian? So amphibian, the word actually means dual life and it's very fitting because all of these animals do lead these kind of double lives. The first part is in water and then the second part is often out on the land. So to be an amphibian, it means you have gills during at least one stage of your life cycle. Um, they can be very clear like this salamander larvae here, or they can be kind of hidden. Um, let's see, it's gonna move our faces out of the way. This is a toad tadpole and they're kind of hidden, but they're there. They are the oldest vertebrate class that is alive today. Now that is pretty cool. Like when you think about cockroaches, they've been around 280 million years. Uh, sturgeon fish, 300 million years, very impressive. But amphibians, 350 million years ago is when they evolved. So they've seen it all. They've just kept on going through extinctions and global crises. And they're just very hardy little creatures. And I think that that's really impressive. So under the umbrella of amphibian, we have three separate orders. We have the Chordata, which is newts and salamanders, and they have tails. We have the Sicilians. These are very rare and elusive creatures. Um, I've never seen one. And they're actually these limbless amphibians. They look like little worms almost. And the Anura, frogs and toads. And Anura means tailless. So frogs and toads don't have tails, unlike the salamander and newts. And although they have lasted 350 million years, they're currently in crisis. So there are around 6,000 species of amphibians found across the globe. And they're actually one of the most endangered lineages today. So here, here over in 50%, so 3,000 species of amphibians are currently threatened with decline. Despite this, despite how cool they are, how old they are, how threatened they are, they're actually one of the least studied vertebrate species. So that means there is so much we still don't know about them, which makes it really hard to save them. And why is this? Why is there a crisis? Uh, it's really a cocktail of factors, a lot of habitat destruction. So we're draining a lot of wetlands for development, for agriculture. And not only are we destroying habitat, but we're kind of fragmenting it. So we'll talk about how the boreal toad is a migratory species. A lot of toads, especially but amphibians, use different parts of the landscape during different parts of their life cycle. So they'll have breeding ponds in spring, they need to find hibernation sites in winter, 
and in some are foraging habitats. And not only are we destroying these habitats, but even building a road between said habitats can cause barriers, so they're not really getting everything they need. Introduced species, um, a local example of that is the Eastern Bullfrog from the Eastern USA, but they have traveled west and they're causing some chaos in the ecosystems out here. They're really big, they outcompete native amphibians, they even prey on native amphibians. Overexploitation, both in human diet and in the pet trade. Climate change is a big one, especially places like Utah where we have these kind of snow driven watersheds. If the waters, the kind of water table starts changing, surface runoff starts changing, the breeding season that our toads are currently used to may not align with when we have ponds available for them. So that's a pretty big deal, especially around here, especially being one of the driest states in the USA. Pollution, um, toads, frogs, salamanders, they have this very porous skin. So when they're in the water, they are likely to be absorbing everything in that environment and it can be very harmful. And a really big one, and most of you may have heard about this because if you know me, I harp on about it all the time, is chytrid fungus. And this is a fungus that is now found on every single continent where there are amphibians. It is not choosing who to attack, it attacks everyone and it causes amphibians to kind of spread, um, well, that's a little, uh, little developed in what's happening, but it can really cause their skin to harden and it makes movement very difficult and it makes kind of regulating their fluid intake very, very difficult. And it's actually caused widespread population die-offs, especially in certain newts in Europe, but right here in the USA as well. So we do know that chytrid is here in Utah. It has affected some of our boreal toad populations. And there's research right now into how we can help amphibians. A lot of research is coming out of Colorado State University um, with Purple Rain, which is a really cool name. And also some genetics work is suggesting the toads in Utah may have a certain resistance to chytrid. So there's so much research going into it, but it's kind of early days and we're still trying to figure out how to battle this kind of very detrimental fungus. But why should you care? You know, I'm telling you all of these things about amphibians and you may not have even seen an amphibian for a year. Like they're not really part of people's lives every day, but they are very important. And I'm just gonna go through some things real quick about why you should care, get you on board. They are really fantastic cultural symbols. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that salamanders kind of controlled fire and they could put out fire or start fires. In ancient Egypt, they were worshipped. They are symbols of fertility, of good fortune, luck. Frogs are thought to help you come into money in some countries. So they do hold these like very elevated positions throughout history in different cultures. Tadpoles and water quality. Tadpoles actually, they're very voracious little herbivores and they can help keep down algal blooms and stop a lot of ponds and creeks becoming choked with vegetation food chain. Because of that biphasic life cycle, that kind of terrestrial aspect and aquatic aspect, they're really cool. So they're kind of connecting these two quite separate food chains of land and water. And in some forests, amphibians are actually kind of the most biomass bivertebrate and getting rid of them both as prey and as predators can have real devastating effects on entire food chains as environmental indicators. So I mentioned about how their skin's very porous and they can absorb these kind of pollutants very early on. So you can kind of liken amphibians to a canary in a coal mine. So they will be the first things to go when environmental conditions start to decline. And that's why we can use them as these indicators. So if amphibians start disappearing from wetlands, we really should, you know, be pretty alarmed because what's happening to them is going to spread out and start affecting other animals. Human medicine and research, I think 20, 15 to 20% of all Nobel Prizes can attribute their research to amphibians in some way. And one of my favorite cool gross facts is the original pregnancy test was the African clawed frog. And they would take a woman's urine 
pour it on the frog and if she was pregnant the frog would produce eggs within eight to twelve hours so keep that in your back pocket for your next party because it's a cool fact and um, pest control amphibians they just devour many many invertebrates insects they keep the mosquito population down so they really can have a big impact on human lives even if you're not kind of around them all that often they're very far-reaching effects so right here in North America, although Brazil by far holds the kind of trophy for most amphibian species in one country with over a thousand, the USA has its own medal because the USA has the most species of salamander than any other country in the world. Uh, we have 300 species of amphibians and it is very recognized by kind of government organizations and nonprofits and there's protections in place for these special animals. So the Lacey Act um, back in 2016 put 201 salamander species on a list to kind of prevent them coming into the USA because there is a chytrid fungus specifically attacking salamanders. And to my knowledge, it's not in North America yet. And this is kind of helping keep that that way because we are such a special place for salamanders. Uh, there are 36 species of amphibian on the Endangered Species Act. Big nonprofits and charities like Amphibian Arc kind of pouring research and funding into these programs on site. And of course, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, so AZA zoos, are providing kind of care, education, these breeding programs, releasing amphibians back into the wild. So there's a lot of people working together to really help protect these special little critters. Okay, start of the show, boreal toads. Uh, their scientific name is Anaxurus boreus boreus. Anaxurus is the genus of toad that's found only here in North America. So North American true toad. Boreal toads here, you can see their range map. Um, can you see my mouse? I'll say that you can. So up here from Alaska all the way through Canada, down the west coast of Baja, California, is where this species is found. Boreas is kind of rooted in this ancient Slavic term of the mountains, which is perfect for this animal because they are a high elevation species. They live at 5,000 foot or higher, so they're very mountainous. And for an amphibian, they are highly terrestrial. So we always think about the frogs kind of peeking out of water and staring at you with those big eyes. But toads, they love being on land. They like to use it to hunt beetles and spiders and ants. They're not very graceful on the land. They're not very graceful in the water either though. And like I said, they migrate to all different parts of the landscape, different times of the year. And Mary's gonna talk more about how to like really ID a toad when you find one out in the field later on in this presentation, but I'll go over some characteristics quickly. So adults can be from this like deep brown to these bright green, olive, kind of very neutral colors. 90% of the time they have this creamy stripe, it's called a dorsal stripe, it runs along their back and it's an identifying feature. Here in Utah, there's one other toad that looks very similar to this is the woodhouses toad but they occupy low elevation sites so if you're above five six thousand feet and you see a toad with this stripe it's probably a boreal toad so they have these irregular spots across their back also these inky black spots on the underside and this should work this is what they sound like hey, little peeping chicks um, they don't actually cool here in Utah, which is interesting because they do cool up in Canada, but this is like an alarm sound when you're, when you're picking them up and kind of surprising them. Cute little guy, look how cute. So boreal toads eggs are laid in long gelatinous strings. Another fun fact, when people ask you a difference between a toad and a frog, which you know they're going to at some point in your life, toads often lay these long strings of eggs, whereas frogs lay clumps of eggs. Strings, clumps. So toads here, we've got these nice long gelatinous strings and the tadpoles are jet black and they have these beautiful teardrop shapes with their eyes inset on top of their head, 
which will become important when we're talking about identification later on. So they have this delicious diet of insects and worms. They love to travel. And what sounds like a dream, they hibernate up to six months of the year. So these are not a freeze tolerant species. Some amphibians are, toads are not. So what they have to do is find a nice burrow or root system, get below that frost line and just wait out winter until spring comes and they pop back up. Best fact of all, their toxins smell just like freshly ground peanut butter. So keep a, a nose out for that smell when you're out there. So right here in Utah, we have several isolated meta populations, 11 or 12, depending on who you talk to. There's still beta gaps in our knowledge. We don't know everywhere where these toads are. We've got a pretty good idea with these populations, but places like the Wasatch, it is just full of boreal toad habitat, but we see them so rarely. And there's got to be wetlands out there that just thriving with little populations of boreal toads. So that is where you guys come in. But what we do know isn't all good news. We know that a lot of these populations throughout Utah are declining in number. And for those same reasons that we spoke about earlier, the chytrid fungus, the invasive species, these kind of increased pressures from all sides. So what is being done about it? Um, I talked a little about the partnerships and we have zoos working with these assurance colonies um, to kind of put numbers back out into the wild. Outreach, we have a very big education department here at the zoo and they actually take toads and salamanders out to, they hit every single third grade class in Utah every few years. So they're teaching about wetlands and how children can be kind of respectful and appreciative of these wetlands, helping protect the boreal toad and other amphibians. We're trying to fill these data gaps. Where are they? Where are they breeding? What kind of water quality do they like? What is their movement? Just all the data we can get about them is going to help us protect them. And habitat improvements. World Utah Project has been amazing at facilitating BDAs, which are beaver dam analogs. And they kind of back up these fast flowing creeks and create all this beautiful, slow moving water, which is just ideal habitat for toads, as well as migratory birds, invertebrates, fish, you name it. They love BDAs. So it's kind of a concert of different things going on by all different partners and we're trying to really work together to create this kind of push in conservation for these little guys. So what can you do? Uh, educate yourself and others, learn more about amphibians, they're super cool. Uh, leave no trace when you go out hiking and camping, just pack up behind you, don't leave kind of plastics and other pollution out there. If you see a toad, look but don't touch, that kind of goes for any amphibians, especially if you're not wearing gloves. Because again, that skin can soak up any lotions, sun creams you might have on your hands. Uh, be an eco-friendly consumer. That goes for, especially here, kind of water consumption. Preserve habitat. You can even create habitat if you have land and property. Support your local conservation groups and join our community science program. All right, so it's was a kind of whirlwind tour of amphibians and toads and why we're all here. So let's talk a little bit about our community science project. So in this chapter, we're just gonna talk about what is community science? You may have heard it as citizen science as well, kind of two terms for the same thing. We'll go through some quick examples of other community science programs, maybe a new term to you, but it's a very old concept. And once I start talking about it, I bet different things will come to mind and like, oh, I know what community science is. The aim of this program, the history of the program and data collected so far, ways that you can participate, how to sign up, and then we'll look at our field calendar for the year. So what is community science? This was the best way I've seen it kind of described. So it is a research collaboration between scientists and volunteers. So community science expands opportunities for scientific data collection while providing access to scientific information to community members. It is just a really great way to collect 
so much data, whether it be over time, over a large landscape, just different species, different topics. There's community science programs going on. We are choosing different constellations in the sky to research. There's community science programs where they're having people look at coral photos underwater. It just spans across the whole world now. And it's super cool because it's a great way to get people involved in scientific research and science needs more people. So here are some examples that I bet you have heard of. So uh, the Audubon Christmas Bird Count, this is the longest running community science program. And you, I'm sure many people here have heard of that. Zooniverse, if you have worked with some of World Utah Project's other research, you'll be very familiar with Zooniverse. And this allows people to connect with research all over the world and help ID different photographs, mainly of animals, but of all kinds of things, really. And I think well, we're past the anniversary of the COVID earthquake week, which I'm sure is cemented in people's minds. But USGS, the um, US Geological Society has, did you feel it? Where if there was an earthquake, you can just click on this link and say, yep, I felt it. And then they can map how far those earthquakes have spread throughout the USA. So just some cool examples and things that you can also participate in. So the aim of this program, back to us. So the Boreal Toad Community Science work has several main goals. We want to collect data on where toads are. This is our number one goal. We have a pretty good grip on the populations we know, but again, there's just so much land in Utah. It's beautiful, so much wetlands that we need to go and explore. So we just want to know where every single toad in the state is. So we need you. Keep record of where they are breeding. This is particularly important because we want to make sure they continue breeding in these places. If we see that the toads have been breeding in a certain pond for 20 years. We haven't seen eggs or tadpoles for the last five years. Like something's happening to that wetland. Once we know what that is, we can work to resolve it and get that population back on track. And that goes hand in hand with monitoring water quality in these habitats. And Mary will talk a little more about that later on, but we do have really cool water monitoring equipment that you guys will get to use and it records things like water temperature, the pH, the salinity. So we can keep an eye on that. Keep a track of population numbers, help with habitat restoration, and keep toads off the endangered species list. This is what we're doing. This is why we're here. So we've been doing a great job so far. So let's keep it going. So we have kind of, this is from iNaturalist, which is a really cool, I know I keep saying that, but everything about this project is super cool. So iNaturalist is a whole website and data set, and it is fueled by community scientists. You can upload anything you see, kind of any living species, plants, birds, butterflies, and it will create these beautiful graphs. So this is all driven by public sightings. So this is when we start seeing a lot of boreal toads. So we kind of model our season on these. Um, observations of toads. Historical records that the, D the DWR, the Division of Water Resources has, they've been studying toads for 30 plus years here in the state. And then just the logistics, proximity to Salt Lake City. So all of the surveys we do are here within Utah. So over the last five years, we've had well over hundred community scientists. We've put in I think over 6,000 hours into the field now, across 130 sites. We've taken biometrics, which is kind of the weight and length and photos of toes, hundreds of times. We have met hundreds of toes. And sometimes we want to meet the same toad every year, and it is really joyful. <laughs> so there's several ways you can participate. You can just support local conservation groups. You can support the zoo. You can support Wild Utah Project the aquarium, all of these great conservation organizations here in Salt Lake City. We're so lucky to live here. Um, join me, come out on a survey with me. I love taking people out. Uh, we'll have lead surveys, both day and camping trips this year. 
And if you're not into that, conduct an independent survey. We will have the opportunity to collect code buckets full of equipment from the zoo and other places in Salt Lake. And if you're going to go on a hike up in the Wasatch, come grab a bucket, take it with you. Um, you don't know what you're going to see. So just to reiterate on that a little, we do have field trip calendars. They are ready to go. We have June and July set, and there'll be more dates coming in August, the closer we get. So you can commit to a date on the field trip calendar, a day survey, or a camping trip. We have been using our own vehicles in 2020, but if you can show a negative COVID-19 test, 72 hours prior to the trip, you're welcome to come in the zoo vehicle. These tests are rapid, free, and available throughout Salt Lake. So it shouldn't be too hard to get them right now. It's hard to know what's going to happen. The dates for the lead trip start in late June, but the independent surveys can start tomorrow. And there are sites throughout the whole state from Grouse Creek Mountains up on the border of Idaho, all the way through kind of that mountainous crest in the center of the state down to the Ponscon, which is our southernmost population. And that is very close to uh, Bryce National Park. Secondly, you can choose to adopt a site if you wanted to. If you've been with us for the last five years, which I know some of you have, and you've really grown pretty connected to some of these sites that you have adopted every year. So you can choose a location and you can go there three, four, five times this summer. We love it, we want all this data. You can come and pick up a toad bucket and go on just an independent survey throughout the Wasatch. And you can pick those up from the zoo or World Utah Project. So two ways to participate. And how to sign up. Oh. So we will share a link with all of you and it will take you to our field calendar and also our resources page, which you can see. Here. So on the World Utah Project page, you're just going to scroll right to the bottom and you'll see we have here kind of field form for you to print off, survey protocols. We have the recording of this training. We'll have ID guides, just kind of a one-stop shop for all the things that you may need. Here is a screenshot of what the sign-up sheet will look like. So you can see we'll send out this link via email. And perhaps in the chat too. And here we have camping trips, lead day trips, independent site visits. So you can choose between these three things, tabs along the bottom, all from the same internet link. And we'll have the camping trips, where we're going, how long for the dates. And then once you're on that page, you can hover over these cells and it will tell you more about that trip, kind of the hiking difficulty, information about historical um, boreal toad observations there, have we seen tadpoles there? And all you're gonna do, you're gonna put your name in here, put your email in here, and I'll email you the rest. So this is the camping trip. This is what the lead day trip page looks like, very similar situation, name and email, I'll get back to you, information up here. And the independent, site visits. Again, you can choose to adopt a site such as Silver Lake here, have three different visits, sign up throughout. And now we have date ranges here. So May, June, July, for example. Oh, and we have come to our question and answer session. So I think Sarah will be popping back on right now. And Mary too, let's all be here. Okay, um, Mary, let me know if you have any issues getting on. Um, but we have had a couple of questions in the chat. And just a reminder for folks, if you'd like to ask your question um, verbally, you're free to unmute mute yourselves now. You should be able to do that. So feel free. Um, we'll just be reading through some of the questions in the chat and then, yeah, just pipe up if you have something to say and we'll, we'd be happy to ask or answer any questions. 
So one question we have from Jennifer Gee is, are boreal toads ever found at lower elevations? Mm -mm. No, they are so well adapted to those higher elevations. I think they really like those kind of first, second order streams, creating those really nice, cool pond habitats that you find higher up. It's usually less polluted higher up as well. So I think the lowest I've seen a boreal toad was around 5,000 foot, but that was up in Washington state. And I know the lowest populations in Utah are up in the Grass Creek Mountains. And I think that's five and a half thousand feet. But no, you don't find them low down. There might be a, a tiny overlap with the Woodhouse's toad, but that's the kind of toad you'll find down lower. It's pretty cool how they just have their little niches and adapt so well to those areas. Yeah. Um, we also have a couple questions on if people are wanting to come out on field trips with you, um, can they show proof of full vaccination in place of a negative COVID test? Um, no, we are, we don't have any say on if you get vaccinated or not. Um, so we have to treat everyone the same and to treat everyone the same, we just need to ask for a negative test from everyone. Perfect. Um, and then Mark Burton Adams asks, in a perfect world, how long does a boreal toad live? <gasps> they are so long lived for such a small creature. Uh, we know that one toad that they have been tracking in Grouse Creek Mountains is, I think, 16 years old now. So uh, 16 years old at least. And an interesting thing that I need to read more about is people are thinking they live so long because they hibernate and kind of slow everything down for half of the year. So usually in captivity, you see longer lived animals, but with the boreal toad, we're actually seeing shorter lifespans in captivity. And we're thinking it's because we're not hibernating them for the same length of time as in the wild. So maybe their metabolism is going faster, so they're not living as long in total. Research needs to be done. But 16 plus years, they, they can get pretty old when they're... That's amazing. <laughs> I, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the assurance populations, do they have like a special mark? Are they uh, monitoring how many of them like get refound out in the wild? That's it. Brilliant question. So far, we are reintroducing tadpoles and very, very, very newly metamorphed toadlets. So we're struggling to find something small enough to track them. So there is an invis invis a visible elastomer, which is like a liquid rubber, and you can inject that into their tiny little toes, and then you'll see it under a UV light. But even the toadlets are too small to be doing that. So one thing that people have done in the past is do little toe clips. So you clip off the toe of the toadler. And then when you find toads in five years time that have that toe missing, you know it's from the captive population. There's a lot of ethical considerations with that. So we haven't tracked any yet. And we have been doing it a few years now. And we did release tadpoles from Denver Zoo in 2020. But in terms of program longevity, it's still relatively new. So we're still thinking of ways that we can track the success of the assurance colony. And if anyone has any ideas, we are we're always. Great question. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then we have a question from Jeremy also on the elevations question. Um, were boreal toads found at lower elevations in the past? Ooh, hmm. not the recent past, but historically, I mean, they could have been. We are seeing a lot of animals moving up to these higher elevations as the climate does warm. I don't, I don't think we have any suggestion in the scientific literature that they that the elevation range has changed, at least since we've been tracking it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but we are seeing where they have historically in our history, right? In the last 30 years, 
where they have historically occurred at higher elevations, we see a decline there. So within the native range that we know of from the literature, the, the occupancy of the toad has shrunk dramatically. And that's not just in Utah, that's across the West. And interestingly, it's not in places that, not always in places that have had a bunch of development or urbanization, this is happening all over the place. So um, Glacier National Park um, it has always had a very robust amphibian population and had lots of boreal toads. And it's what, what most people would consider as like fairly pristine habitat. And we're seeing declines of boreal toads there. So, um, so I don't think it's so much that having to do with elevation, their natural history, um, is one of the reasons that they they persist in higher alpine wet um, habitats. And so it's, to our knowledge, that's just their habitat. But they the occupancy again, yeah, is decreasing. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Emily Young about the, the site sign-up sheet, um, who says, it looks like there are three to six sign-up spots per independent site would we still be able to go to a site once it fills up? Yes, you definitely can. And um, I will talk a little bit more in detail about these independent site visits, but you can always just shoot me an email. Um, I think our emails are included on the sign up uh, spreadsheet. So I'll make, I'll double check. Um, but yeah, you could always add a site to that list as well. If you're out hiking in the Wasatch and you see a wet meadow and you want to add that location, you can. If there's a place on the list that you really want to head out to, but someone else has already signed up for it, um, you're more than welcome to complete the survey and um, share those data with us. It will just increase our chances of seeing toads at different life stages. Um, so yeah, you're, you're welcome to do that. Perfect. Um... And then Kristen Watkins um, asks about the link to the sign-up sheets. So I did put that in the chat. Let me, I'll, I will put that in again, just so it's in case folks have joined in the last couple of minutes. Um, yeah, so that, that link will take you to the camping trips, lead day trips and independent site visits all in one sheet. So, and we'll also be sending out an email as well with all the links, so. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, maybe we'll give folks just a minute or two before moving on. So it sounds like for the Q&A session, folks can unmute themselves. So if you don't want to use the chat, you can go ahead and unmute. Yeah. Um, how often do people uh, do people find like repeat toads? Is it um are there generally like when people find them out in the field, uh, have they been seen before or are they generally like I don't know how to phrase? Yeah, I think I understand like the percentage of brand new toads to toads that we've seen before. Yeah. Um depends on the site they've been using i'm gonna go on out show you guys um these are called pit tags passive internal transponder tags i believe and they're essentially the same as the microchips that you put in your pet cat and dog at the vet and they are so tiny you might i'm not sure if you'll see actually just these they're like the size of a grain of rice basically right yeah wow. so they've been they, the DWR and also the zoo, have been sliding these little transponders under the skin of toads for 15 to 20 years now in some sites. So up in the grass creeks, they've put out over a thousand of these little pit tags in toads. So up there, you're very likely to come across a toad that has been seen before. But places like um, the little West Fork Duchesne, is at one of our sites and they have this really healthy kind of breeding population 
and they're really hard to find there because it's like very thick willows, very complex habitat. So when we go there, we're usually finding new toads each time. But I think they're using these kind of mark recapture numbers to estimate population size, which is a pretty cool method for finding out how many toads are at a site because you're not going to find every single toad every single time. So using things like pit tags and sometimes they're doing photos of kind of the back and front, the dorsal ventral sides of toads, and they can ID toads by their markings, which is, um, you gotta have some eagle eyes to do that. So it really depends on the site, how long people have been surveying there, how complex it is. Not really an answer, I'm sorry. No, that's fine, thank you so much. <laughs> of course. We have one more question from Jennifer Key about toad buckets, if folks need to sign up somewhere uh, or if they just give their name to them when they show up. That's exactly it. Yeah, you'll just come to, we're gonna have some right at the main entrance of the zoo and you'll just go to the ticket um, admissions person and ask for a toad bucket and you'll leave your name and you can take the bucket for a week. And then when you bring it back, they'll just double check everything's in there and take your data sheet. And that's it. I'll talk more about all the stuff that's in here. <laughs> Pretty exciting. Um, we have a question from Lauren Housekeeper on sites. So they are wondering if there are any sites further north. Um, they live in Ogden and would be interested in helping in sites up north. Um, just yeah, curious about the sites. Yeah, um, let's think the Monte Cristos, the sites up there, the Grouse Creek mountain range. And if you know of some wetlands, like if you have a favorite hike, a favorite alpine lake, somewhere near Ogden where you are kind of getting the sense that it might be ideal habitat for toads, kind of that slow moving high elevation water, survey there. Again, there's, there's many places we haven't been. So if you have some sites around Ogden that you're interested in surveying, you should definitely pick up a bucket. Yeah, and I, I always encourage people to, it, you don't, it'd be great if you know it in advance to pick up a bucket. But um, when we go into detail about the protocols, you'll see you can complete the majority of the survey and the habitat assessment without any equipment. And we'll talk about how to do that um, safely. Um, so what I do every year when I go out hiking with my family, I just have the field form in my pack or a couple copies of it in case I come across something. So yeah, if you're, if you're above 6,000 feet, you see a wet meadow, a spring or a seep pond or you're near a lake, um, anything that is kind of, yeah, slow moving, fairly shallow water. Um, yeah, feel free to complete a habitat assessment. Even if you don't see toads, we'll be happy to take those, um, those data. Perfect. We have another question from Tamara who says, what is the best method to capture hand or nets? So we'll talk about this in the field uh, protocol section after this Q and A. Um, we definitely recommend using hands. And if you are using your hands that you're there gloved, uh, Kaylee already mentioned how if you have any lotions or even just the oil from your skin um, can be not the best. And I'll talk in more detail about this, but the gloves are for the toads protection. There's no concern for people handling toads. So there's no harm to you, but we're trying to protect the toads. More details to come. So the peanut butter is not harmful. <laughs> The peanut butter smell. <laughs> Just bonus points. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't see any other questions. So I think we can move on just a couple minutes early to our next session on the protocols. Great. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. I'm just going to progress through here slides that we've already seen, I hope. And for those of you who have attended this training year after year, there have been changes and updates most years, 
Um, I will say the protocol has not changed between 2020 and 2021. So this is very much going to be a repeat for a lot of you. So I understand if you need to maybe tune out and this will be recorded if you ever wanna check back in and review the material. But again, thanks for being here. Um, and we'll have time for Q&A after, um, after the field protocol section. And yes, this is being recorded. It will be sent out. Um, if you're on this webinar, you're on the email list to get the follow-up uh, communications, which will include this recording. So the last uh, section of the webinar tonight, the field survey protocols, um, we're just gonna go over a little bit more natural history in terms of what to look for. Where are those toads when you're out looking for them? Um, how to conduct a survey, a good habitat example, so you kind of know what you're looking for out there, uh, the field gear that you're going to need, and we're going to go through the data sheet in um, detail, which again, a lot of you have seen many times, so uh, you can always refer back to this. So just a reminder on the purpose and intent of these field surveys, you all are helping us fill crucial data gaps about where aquatic habitat for amphibians are located and what the current condition of those habitats are. And I always focus on this because I want people to know that if you do not see a toad, it is still a very worthwhile effort. We are gathering information about the condition of habitat and where it is, which sounds really basic, but if we don't have that foundation information, um, you know, it's really hard for folks to prioritize where to release toads or where to prioritize habitat protections or restoration. So super important, even if you don't see toads the days you go out. Um, also super important to this process is just building this team of expert community scientists. We have some folks where this is their, I think maybe um, fifth or sixth year and they go to some of the same, you know, remote places and they're really stewards of that habitat because they go multiple times a year trying to increase their chances of seeing toads at different life stages. Um, so it's, it's really crucial that we've had this, this team that's developed over the years of what I would really call some of you as expert community scientists. And uh, again, even if we're not seeing toads all the time, particularly in the Wasatch, it's really helping us get a handle on the landscape and how toads may be using habitat and how habitats, again, can be restored or protected for future efforts. Just a, a visual here. Um, this is a map produced by Diane Manus at uh, the Utah Geologic Survey. And on the right hand side, you can just see some data points um, that indicate breeding or um, toad habitats that did not have active breeding that have been surveyed fairly regularly. And on the left, you can see this um, map of the landscape where you have this color gradient um, of very light blue to dark blue. And these color gradients indicate a ranking of habitat suitability based on the variables that you all are uh, collecting data on in the field. So you'll see um, all this information, whether it's about vegetation, the depth of the water, temperature, and all sorts of variables that you all will be collecting on habitat goes into this larger database to help us uh, rank where the most potentially suitable habitats occur on the landscape. Again, super important for conservation planning and for those habitat managers. And just a little bit about the central Wasatch site selection, as this is uh, the majority of the independent sites that you could sign up to go to anytime on your own that works for your own schedule. Um, some folks may wonder, you know, how did these sites get selected? So some of these sites are based on historic locations, meaning there's data going back 30 years or more recently, um, just a couple years where toads have been observed before. Obviously wet areas, lakes, and then the surrounding wetlands of lakes and ponds. 
stream complexes and riparian corridors, um, pond networks where there are beaver complexes or a series of beaver dams that slow the flow of water. All of these could be potentially suitable habitat, particularly these, there's all sorts of little springs and seeps um, just below the larger bodies of water that people often hike to in the Wasatch. And because it's portions of the, of the Wasatch are so lush with so much vegetation, um, even just those shallow springs and seeps and wet meadows with just inches of water, but the flow is slow and the water stays nice and cool is phenomenal habitat for toad breeding. And so we can really use your help adding um, sites to the list. So if you're hiking up to Red Pine Lake, for example, and you see a little water trickle or a wet meadow with a few inches of water in a you know shady patch, that is definitely um, potentially suitable habitat that we would love for you to collect um, information on. Um, obviously narrow drainages where again, the water can be cool and the flow is slow, all potentially suitable sites in the Wasatch. Um, just a reminder for the independent site surveys, we wanna make sure that anybody signing up for this is comfortable hiking, you know, potentially rugged terrain to remote locations without a guide. Um, it would be great if you signed up for one of these independent sites that you were able to visit it maybe three times between May and August. If you can only go once, we'll, we'll take those data. We're very grateful. Um, but think about it. If you can sign up for a site and think of it as uh, being the steward over the site and trying to get there just as snow is receding in May to some of these higher elevation areas, that is when uh, toads start mating. You might see adults out or you might even see some egg strands um, super early. Then mid-season, you may see some tadpoles, those tadpoles absorbing their tails, turning into metamorphs or toadlets um, and all the life stages in between. So if you can hit the same site, um, you know, two or three times, it will really increase your chances of actually seeing a toad. Um, you can sign up for a location and put your name uh, next to a particular location. Again, you could add to that list if you want to. Um, we would really uh, encourage folks to take a field partner with them. Uh, anytime you're out in the field, um, it's a great idea to have somebody with you just for safety. Um, Kaylee already mentioned this, but if it's not required, but if you would like to have the full kit, all the gear um, to complete the entire survey, and if you would like to handle a toad, if you happen to see one, you're going to want to go ahead and check out, um, a, we call them toad buckets, but the field equipment. And we're so grateful, the zoo guest services, the, the first um, office when you go into the gate, if you let them know you want to check out that equipment for the toad study, they will um, they will give you that that gear and take your name down and then within about a week if you can return it and check it back in that would be great. So just a review on how to sign up for the um, independent sites here. You just go to the uh, Wild Utah Project uh, page and if you go to the projects tab. There's an amphibian and aquatic habitat assessment tab. Um, and then if you scroll down to the bottom of that project page, you'll see all those resources, the field form, survey protocol, cheat sheet, which we'll talk about. Um, the, re the recording of the training will be updated. Uh, we have a list of field trip locations and a little bit of information. So you can kind of get an idea of what to expect at these different field trips. Um, and again, that link to the site signup will be added to that list. It's also been added in the chat box, so you can actually look at it right now, real time while we're going over it. Um, what you see on the screen is the tab for the independent site, site visits. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side, that first column is indicating the names of the different locations. Um, you can also see the actual location uh, in UTM, so you could plug that into whatever navigation device that you like to use. Um, we're going to be adding a little more information about 
when you might want to head out to these visits based on elevation and any snow melt information we might have. Um, you can start going out to these sites right away. We haven't had a ton of snow this year, so it's possible that some of these higher elevation spots are accessible sooner than later. And like I indicated before, um, just as the snow is receding from some of these water bodies and wet meadows is when the toads start to get active. And so you, we've actually seen egg strands in little ponds and wet meadows with snow right up against them. So um, I always try to get out again, just as the snow is receding. And I think that really increases your chances of seeing all the different life stages if you can get out earlier. Uh, that being said, every year is different and every site is different, which is why it's super helpful to have folks um, out on the landscape helping us gather these data. You'll also notice there's a, co a column here uh, labeled difficulty. So it gives you an idea of how easy, moderate or strenuous of a hike you might be signing up for. Um, and again, if you wanna kind of uh, suss out places that you just like to hike and you know there's wet meadows there, uh, we can go ahead and add that to the list. So just take a field form in your pack and, and scope it out. You can always return back with the gear if you want to. So packing list, if you have signed up for one of these sites, you obviously definitely wanna have that field form printed out. I usually print out several and we'll talk about why because you often come across multiple sites, not just one. Um, I also recommend uh, printing out the field form key or the sheet sheet, sheet um, which is also on that list of resources. And I'll show you what that looks like shortly. A couple different writing utensils, any extra paper for notes. Um, the water quality uh, multimeter is indicated there next to the cell phone here. And we'll talk about how to use that. And that will be in the the field bucket, the toad bucket that you would check out. Um, there will also be a GPS in the bucket. You can also just use your sm smartphone or if you have a personal navigation device that you just prefer. So you don't have to use the GPS we've provided. It's um, just to get the location information that you're putting on the field form. Uh, importantly, if you wanna handle toads, you should have the bucket with you, which has a chytrid fungus kit. Again, for the toad safety, not for uh, the people, it's not a threat to us. Um, and any other personal hiking equipment you might need, definitely recommend bringing all weather gear. When you bring a rain jacket, you don't need it. The day you forget it, you really wish you had it, right? Um, so all the food and water and any other gear you would normally bring for a hike. Um, field partner would be really highly recommended as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So the supplemental material or the cheat sheet indicated here, easy to print off. I recommend printing it off in color. Um, it's two-sided. You can also just load it um, onto your smartphone or whatever device. Um, and I will talk about these that in a little more detail. Um, so finding a boreal toad, if, so first and foremost, if you're out at a site that's on the list, um, it's there because there's probably historic uh, record of toad being there. So what you wanna look for again is low velocity, slow moving water. So stream, seeps, marshes, beaver ponds, um, any margins of maybe faster moving water where the water is shallow and is moving more slowly. Um, they can also be on the ground in the surrounding area, obviously. Um, we often look for small mammal burrows. So around the water body or around the wet meadow, if you notice any burrowing activity, uh, toads will repurpose burrows made by other animals. And certainly if you see a wet meadow, a wetland, and there's a kind of obvious perimeter again with shallow water or banks, that is a great uh, uh, path to walk looking for toads. And remember, as you're walking um, at different life stages, the toadlets sometimes are the size of your, you know, pinky fingernail, depending on the size of your finger. So um, be careful where you step because they, there could be an emergence of um, some quite small toadlets. 
And if you want to, you can also um, you know, flip logs if you see woody debris. If you do that, um, just be aware there are rattlesnakes, obviously. Um, so you want to use caution and pay attention if you're going to be flipping anything. Um, in terms of finding a boreal toad, if you are above 7,000 feet, we even think maybe six to 6,500 feet in elevation, you're really not going to confuse a boreal toad for anything else, right? They, they're very stocky. They have that warty appearance. They're not smooth like frogs. Um, and they have that really distinct white or creamy uh, dorsal stripe there. The other, sal uh, the other amphibians you'll see at these elevations are tiger salamander and the western chorus frog. And we'll talk a little more about the chorus frog, but you can see it has a much smoother appearance to its skin and again does not have that very distinct creamy dorsal stripe. So you're not really going to confuse the boreal toad for anything else at these high elevations. However, there is a lot of diversity, particularly in um, color schemes of boreal toads and of course size. So you can see this little guy here adjacent to a penny. Um, and maybe I'll try to remember, Kaylee has um, probably has the grams uh, weight on some of the bigger toads that she's held. I think she might have the record for one of the bigger females in the Wasatch. Um, so diversity in size and color, uh, depending on where you are in the Wasatch and the life stage of the individual. Again, just being really distinct here, the chorus frog can be in similar habitat. It's a fairly smooth frog, uh, fairly small frog with smooth skin, um, has dark stripes across the eye, almost looks like it has a little mask there. Um, but importantly, it's missing that creamy dorsal stripe. So don't think you guys will have any trouble making that distinction. It can be a little tricky in murky water if you are seeing juvenile um, tadpoles or sad salamander juveniles. Um, so just take a quick look. Um, tiger salamanders at their aquatic stage have external gills. Um, or you're seeing something that is starting to absorb its, its gills and being uh, at the terrestrial stage. So again, probably not going to confuse that with the boreal toad. The tadpoles can be a bit tricky. So here on the left, you're seeing a boreal toad tadpole. It is, as Kaylee mentioned before, solid black teardrop, teardrop shape. And the eyes are really, um, on the dorsal side, right? So you kind of have a smooth margin to this tadpole. Whereas chorus frog tadpoles, their eyes are really on the lateral portion on the side of the head. Um, so if you were to see the silhouette, this would be the chorus frog where the eyes are kind of popping out and the boreal toad tadpole, you wouldn't see that uh, on the margin because the eyes are more um, on the dorsal side. Here's another image, boreal toad here, a uh, chorus frog here. And just for the heck of it, another image of tiger salamander larvae. Again, if these are flying past you in murky water, you might have to do, uh, give it another look. But again, you can see these external gills. Here you see the external gills again. So hopefully not too much confusion. And Kaylee mentioned this before, the um, distinction between the eggs. So boreal toads, again, have those strands of eggs. And this is actually what I've seen, you know, kind of at a distance, you see these egg strands here. And because the eggs are so dark, it almost looks like black ribbons. Um, I've had to do a double take. It looks like trash or debris in the water. And if any of you are old enough to know what a um, unraveled cassette tape looks like. That's kind of what it reminds me of when I've seen them uh, versus the chorus frog eggs, which are in clumps like this. And as Kaylee mentioned, um, salamander eggs also are clumped. <clears throat> so we're gonna go ahead and launch into the details of the field form. Um, so it's just a front back field form. So just two sides to it. It looks like there's a lot of information in here. There's a lot of text, but 
Um, the back side is almost completely multiple choice and uh, many sections of the front portion, um, particularly here, will just be left blank. We just leave a lot of spaces for information in case you need it. So don't be too um, overwhelmed looking at that field protocol. Uh, first and foremost, we want to focus on just the basic information, the date, time, location, the weather when you're out doing your survey, any amphibians that were detected, a summary site description, and we're very interested in different disturbance types that you may observe while you're out in the field. So here you can see um, a filled out field form. Start and end time is really helpful for us, um, especially if it's a known site and later you can indicate how much of the site that you've surveyed. So it lets us know if somebody only had time to take you know, 20 minutes to half hour, we might go back and survey again, particularly if you start to see um, amphibians. Uh, just a reminder for the um, location, UTMs are typically what we use. And if you're using our GPS or a GPS unit of your own, that's fairly easy to find the location um, in UTMs on your GPS. If you're not familiar with those sorts of devices, you can use the Compass app that comes standard on most smartphones. It'll probably give you the location in lat long. Um, if you're out in the field and you wanna just jot down lat long, that is fine. We can always do that conversion later. Um, if you wanna do something a little more sophisticated using your own phone, there are lots of free applications you can download. So Commander Compass Lite is one. Um, Garmin has several other apps you can download on your phone. Um, so any of those would be just fine for finding your location. The next part of the field form is a multiple choice question about the weather. So here we've indicated mostly clear and calm. Um, if there's a, any indication of rain, you would indicate that as well. The next portion is whether you have found any amphibians. Um, so you can say, go ahead and say yes, if you've seen anything. Um, water body number, we'll talk about this in a minute, but you may go to a site that has a wet meadow as well as a lake. So you may indicate the lake as water body one, the wet meadow as water body two. And that way we can see which of those water bodies did you observe an amphibian at. So let's say water body one, they did see a boreal toad. We'd also like you to indicate the life stage. Isn't it adult? Um, a juvenile, uh, a tadpole or a metamorph, meaning maybe the tail isn't quite absorbed yet, or did you see an egg mass? And how did you observe it? Was it calling um, or was there a visual survey? If it's a boreal toad, you are likely not hearing a call and it's probably a visual survey. Um, here you can see on this example, we have a second water body. So maybe this was the wet meadow where a chorus frog was seen or heard in this case. And the next um, bit of the field form is if you could take photos. So obviously if you see amphibians of any life stages, we'd love for you to take a photo. Um, and the way you can keep track of those, I might use a alphanumeric code. Maybe I'd use my initials, um, so my first, photo of egg strands might be MP1. And um, maybe I also took a picture of that larger habitat. Uh, maybe this is a spring or a pond um, photo and I might put MP2 for that. And then I can keep track of these. So when I email my form, I can um, tie the photo that I email along with the form um, to that alphanumeric code, which would be great. The next uh, portion on the form, if you're following along, is to the far right on page one. And that is just the chytrid, uh, chytrid fungus section. So um, just important to call out, if you do handle an amphibian of any kind, it's a good idea to wear gloves. Again, this is mostly if you were to handle one individual that happened to have um, chytrid and then you go pick up something else or another individual, you could potentially spread it between them. Importantly, our footwear can spread chytrid. So if you have mud 
or moisture um, on your feet, uh, whatever footwear you're wearing. Um, so certainly between sites. So if you go, you know, drive to a site, tromp around, and then go drive to another place, or you're just hiking the next day elsewhere, we really recommend you clean your boots just in case so that we're not spreading that fungus for the amphibians from one location to another. So the kit comes with uh, the gloves, uh, cleaner, and a scrub brush of some sort. As for the field form, it also um, asks you if you want, if you did find a toad to do a chytrid swab. Um, and so the kit for that is obviously the gloves, but there's also what I like to call a glorified Q-tip in the tube here. And so you'll notice on the form um, a question as to whether a chytrid swab sample was taken. And you can write down the number um, associated with that swab that you took. So um, a little more up close here, you can see um, here you can indicate the ID number that you write on the tube holding the Q-tip. And there's a little video associated with this, but it's not functional. If you are holding a toad and you are going to do a chytrid swab, um, you can hold them fairly gently, uh, but you also wanna make sure you have them firmly enough in hand that they don't uh, jump out on you and fall from the distance you're standing, hopefully. You might wanna kneel down while you're doing this. And if you go to swab the toad, you wanna think about places where mud, um, or debris might sit. So crevices like between fingers and toes, under the chin, um, armpits and elbows, um, any crevices you can swab uh, and that will increase your chances of, of detecting chytrid if it is present on the individual. Okay, now we're about halfway through the, the first page here. You can see some basic uh, site description information. If fish are present, we'd like to get no, yes or no. Um, if you don't know the species, that is okay. If you do or wanna take a stab at it, you can put it in there. Um, you can also indicate here if the entire site was searched, yes or no. Uh, in other words, if, if it was a perimeter of a large wet meadow and you only did the north side, um, you can indicate that here. Um, indicating whether the site is natural, man-made, or if you don't know, that's okay too. You can put uncertain. Same with um, drainage. We'd like to know if it's permanent, intermittent, or if there's no drainage. Um, and then you can always leave some comments here. If you're uncertain about anything, you can put your own little descriptor in here. And the second por um, portion of this is a sliding scale for disturbance. Zero indicates no disturbance, five is high disturbance, and we give you a little key um, to what we mean by each of the numeric values. So going up to extreme where disturbance is widespread or of high intensity. Um, so you can see for residential in the Wasatch, you're probably gonna have zeros. Um, water management again, probably zeros, but there is a lot of recreation activity and we do maybe see some bare soil that was uh, torn up, um, maybe um, uh, hiking or biking or something like that that's kind of torn up the soil. So you can see those varying levels of disturbance. And then again, you have the option to put a little more detail in the notes uh, for any disturbance you saw at the site. Okay, so you can see this is kind of the completed field form on the first page here. And again, page two looks really um, dense, but again, all these things are multiple choice for the types of water body that are present, the turbidity or how clear or murky the water is, the type of vegetation you see, the depth, um, whether there are shallow waters present at a site, the type of substrate, so whether you have a rocky bottom or a silty bottom. Um, and then the last portion of this field form here is the water chemistry, which is taken by that um, water multimeter that I showed you earlier. So the general characteristics um, is for all water bodies at a site. So you may, again, you may be hiking to a pond or a lake, but there's an adjacent wet meadow. So in that case, you'd have two water bodies, but this first portion 
is just indicating habitat traits across the site. So here you're saying whether you have one, two, three to five or more than five um, water bodies at a site. And turbidity, again, is the water mostly clear all the way into mostly turbid or very murky. Uh, the types of water bodies present. So here at this example, we have a permanent lake or pond as well as a stream. And just some examples of water bodies. So here you're looking at an image of a spring-fed pond. Um, and here we have a wet meadow. Again, just inches of standing water can be great habitat, particularly for breeding and laying eggs. Here we have an active beaver pond. You can see that's really slowing the flow of water and there's some um, probably shallow water backed up behind it. Um, and then we have this um, inactive beaver pond, meaning there's not beaver actively maintaining it. However, it's still functioning to slow the flow and create potential habitat. Permanent lake or pond example, standing water in a met wet meadow example here, um, a temporary pool or pond. So you may go to a site that looks like this early season and late season, it looks like this. Even if you hike up to your site again and you've got some dry patches, that's something we really wanna know. It helps us understand the duration that the water's available. You know, sometimes things dry up before tadpoles have, no ch have a chance to develop and move on. So that's, that's crucial information, even if it's dried up later season. And here we see kind of a classic mar marsh. So again, multiple choice for the types of water bodies present. Um, emergent vegetation, do we see water that is, emer uh, vegetation that is emerging over the surface of the water and how frequent is it? Is it abundant, occasional, completely absent? Um, same thing for submerged vegetation, anything below the surface of the water. Is that abundant um, or is it absent or occasional? These things are really important for us to understand um, how suitable the habitat is for um, things like tadpoles developing. Some of that um, aquatic vegetation really provides shelter so that they can persist in those habitats despite predators like uh, fish and sometimes um, other amphibians. The presence of surface algae, again, multiple choice. Um, chara in the water, we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's an image of that on your cheat sheet. This is um, a non-native plant that kind of outcompetes some of the native plants so that changes what the habitat looks like. So something we're interested in. Um, a relative max depth is what we'd like to to know. Um, so if there's any shallows, that's important to know, but also how deep does that habitat get all together. Um, emergent vegetation along the shore, again, multiple choice. How um, abundant are the shallow areas along the shorelines? And then what is the substrate of silt and, silt and mud? Is it occasional, absent, or abundant? So I keep mentioning this cheat sheet. Here's the first page. Again, images for what we mean by surface algae. There's a couple different options here. And then um, floating vegetation as well as submerged vegetation. Here's an image of the chara and um, also known as muskgrass that we wanna kind of track. And emergent vegetation, again, anything breaking that surface of the water. So that we've completed that kind of first section. This whole midsection of the field form is redundant. You'll see for water body one, water body two, water body three. So depending on the site, you may just be completing that first third. Maybe you only have one water body, maybe you have two, maybe you're using all three. Um, so again, which water body are we focusing on? In this example, a permanent lake or pond, and we're completing all that same information, but just specifically for that water body. And then we get a little more detail as to how much emergent vegetation is present and how much submerged vegetation is present. So this is kind of a guesstimate of percent coverage. And we do that as well for surface algae and chara. Um, I'm just gonna go back slide really quick. Oh, I think it's on the next slide actually. The way you could you can get at that um, percent estimate I'll show you in a minute. 
But you can see these questions are very similar to what we went through before, just for each water body. In this example, we have a permanent lake or pond and a stream, and that's it. So we leave the water body three section blank. And the final portion of the field form here is the water quality metrics. So if you have more than one water body, you wanna indicate that here. Um, if any um, amphibian was present and you took water metrics right by an egg mass or where tadpoles are, we'd wanna, we'd wanna note that here, um, as well as whether you have standing water or flowing water, an estimate on the max depth, usually you're gonna be right there at a shallow, so it's gonna be, um, uh, you know, again, an estimate of shallow water. Uh, you'll be able to take pH with this multimeter, as well as a metric of connectivity and temperature. And the way you're gonna do that, it's a pretty simple device. So you have an on off button and you have a mode button. So once you've turned the device on, you can toggle between pH, temperature and connectivity just by pressing the other button, not the on off button. And what you see here on the bottom, this comes with a cap in this image, the cap is off. Um, here is the little sensor. And so you're going to submerge up to here, basically on the device so that you make sure the sensor is submerged. When you first put the device in the water, you'll see the numbers jump around. So you might need to sit with it for a little while until the numbers level off. And then again, you can just toggle between those three metrics by continuing to press that mode button. We'd also like to know if the water is clear or stained right where you took your measurement. And that is it for the second page of the field form. I know that's a lot of information. Um, again, you can always go back to this recording and we have a cheat sheet with the images as well as a protocol associated with the field form. So if you ever wanna refer back to anything, it's all written down in those materials you can print off from the website. Uh, when you do complete a field form, um, it's probably easiest these days to just take a photo of the form and email that photo to me. If you do have access to a scanner and you wanna scan it in, that's fine. If you, um, checked out field equipment and you just want to physically bring the field form in um, when they collect your bucket they'll also collect the field form that is okay too uh, my preference is just to email it as soon as you're done and take a picture that way things don't get lost um, you can always mail it that's another option as well and as promised, we wanted to kind of end with some, some outcomes. Uh, some of you attended our um, community science thank you event more broadly with all the Wild Utah Project um, volunteers. And I think we discussed some of these outcomes in that. But I just wanna point out in 2020, just a little overview here. We had over 45 community scientists participating um, and we had 150 sites that were visited, 20 independent surveys conducted on the Wasatch Front alone, and over 100 sites were surveyed throughout Utah. Um, toads were located at 25 different sites across the state. And so um, I'm sure all of you are aware with COVID uh, safety protocols, it was kind of amazing how quickly um, people were still very responsive to the project. And I would say overall, our participation was, was phenomenal and, and wasn't hurt by uh, the pandemic. If anything, I think more folks joined community scientists, either family members or friends out in the field who are hoping to get out and hike for a purpose and kind of give back to the community by helping gather these important data for amphibian conservation. So just a quick, um, summary there from 2020. And with that, I think I will turn it over to Kaylee and Sarah. We can answer some questions, but also I wanna give Kaylee some space if there's another, any other outcomes or um, stories from 2020 that you might wanna share.
Hi, everyone, again. Um, from 2020, I think Mary touched on most points. We had like record-breaking numbers at the training. And I think from now, we've kind of learned some things from the pandemic. And going forward, hopefully we'll have kind of a hybridized presenting from now on, where we can be in person and virtual. So I think it really gives an opportunity for people further from Salt Lake to be included, which is great because these toys are found all over the state. Uh, we did find a new breeding site on one of our surveys in the winters in 2020, which is just really great news because it's fun finding toads in new places, but to find an actual breeding site, I'm excited to get there again this summer and see if it's kind of a one-off or we should really start paying closer attention to that area. And I believe between the survey season of 2020 and now, I think the aquarium, Little Zoo, Denver Zoo and Omaha have all produced eggs and tadpoles. So that's the first year that all four, plus while we um, bore more to fish hatchery, so all five partners have successfully bred. So that could make a huge impact on that population this year. So just some- uh that is so exciting about the eggs and the potential for more releases of toads into the wild. And um, I'm sure most people listening understand that, you know, it's not only that you get more individuals out there, but we can start to think about increasing genetic diversity, which can make those populations more resilient to different strains of chytrid. Um, so there's just so many, um, so many exciting things about the potential for uh, repopulating, repatriating in places where the toad already occurs or historically occurred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it's just a huge achievement. So congrats again to the aquarium for what you did this year. They are so fickle. All these toads wanna to do is cease. <laughs> like we give them, our keeper a few years ago, he was paying rain sounds and the breeding calls of other amphibians that would be calling at that time of year. He was recreating like just everything that they would see in the wild and the process to get them to this point. We do actually hibernate our toads in little hibernation chambers in, um, well, it's essentially a fridge but it is tailored to be just like hibernation that they would experience in the winter. And they're in these little mossy beds and they sleep for a couple of months. So we really recreate everything. We warm them up, we bring them out. It's just, it's a process. It's taken up my mind for the past two months getting them to this point. So I'm feeling proud of myself as well. And um, we took a photo of the eggs today. I wonder, keep asking questions. Um, I'll go off on a tangent anytime I can. So, love it. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we have so Darian asked about the recording. So, yes, just a reminder that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on the Wild Utah Project page. Um, and we'll also be sending it out in an email. So, you will have access to this recording to review to your heart's content over the season. Um, and then our next question from Jeremy Brown is um, about the toad buckets, uh, wondering if they'll be available at locations other than the zoo, such as the aquarium. Um, so currently the zoo and World Utah Project are kind of putting the resources into the buckets. And I think for this year, the zoo has hit the limit of equipment that we can put out into the world. I don't know if Old Utah has the ability to create more buckets. Um, and then I can't speak for other institutions as to if they can provide the staff time in giving out buckets. Yeah, I, I guess I would just chime in and say if um, if you, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it, but um, hopefully you won't show up for a bucket and, and there aren't any left. So we'll kind of keep tabs. Um, and if you want to save yourself a trip, if it's a bit of a trip for you, you could email Kaylee or I, and we could make sure there's at least a bucket for you. 
Um, and similarly, if the zoo is um, more of a drive for you, we could we could probably work something out. So if you want to email in advance of your trip and you really want to check out a bucket, we'll get you one. Yeah. And we have a related question about whether folks could make their own kit or toad bucket. Um, Elva and Stella Meyer are located in Menden and just are wondering about avoiding the trip. Um, they also specifically asked about a, a buffer used for the Kittred kit. So yeah, if either of you could speak to making your own toad buckets, that'd be great. Yeah, you know, I think we could probably put together a picture of everything that's in the kit. Um, the one thing that we, you probably wouldn't be able to get is the Kittred swab. Which is, which is okay. Um, and then again, a reminder, you can just go do a trip without, um, without a bucket. That just means you're not handling um, the toads. And it means that that the very last section with water quality stuff will just be left blank. So we're still happy to accept those field forms. Um, we just want you to be super careful um, if you do see a toad, probably just try to avoid handling them, unless maybe you have some latex gloves with you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and Kaylee was showing this swab and the water quality testy guy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then, okay, so Jeremy asks, are there known or are known sites with the chytrid fungus as published? I was trying to find something online. I found something from like 2008. I know that DWR is putting effort into making maps. It's pretty financially, it's a big commitment to get these swabs processed. So I think what the DWR are currently doing is kind of collecting swabs for five or six years from around the state and then putting them all through the lab at the same time. So you kind of pay per plate. So you want to fill that whole plate up with different samples before you're paying for it to go through the machine that tells you if Kitchen is present or not. So I think we're coming up on a year where we're going to be re-testing the whole state. We can't find anything very recent, but I think in most of the places toads are, there is Kitchen. So. So as far as we know, I, I mean, maybe this changed and you know something I don't, but I don't think we have any known chytrid in the Wasatch. So those of you doing the independent visits, however, that doesn't mean it's not there. We just don't have detections for it. And the other thing to keep in mind is like, if you're out hiking in other places in the state, and then you go through the wet meadows in the Wasatch and you're potentially mingling with amphibians, you know, you could be bringing it that way. So it's a great idea to just, um, you know, do the do the wash of whatever footwear uh, once you're about to hike into a site. So, and especially between sites. Perfect. Um, we have another question. So from Saya Zelaznik, Nick, hopefully I, I probably did not pronounce that correctly. Um, other than carefully, is there a safe way to walk through murky water or the wet meadows where you're not sure what's under your feet? I think she's probably talking about safe as in not squishing toads, but I think I'll, we could answer both ways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really tricky. I, I will say, you know, Kaylee and I had this, those of you that heard the training last year, you know, the one of the highlights for me was a couple of years ago, finding toadlets at Silver Lake and they were tiny, tiny, um, probably, you know, first year toadlets. And once we saw them after we'd been traipsing through this wet meadow with lots of thick vegetation, it was just like, oh, let's just be so careful, right? And, you know, they do move around, um, taking a few steps and then looking, taking a few more steps, looking. Um, Kaylee can tell you stories about how someone walking behind another, the first person walking might not see the toad and then they move once they're past. So it's like the second person observes it. So I, I, I just think being careful and recognizing that the toads may be literally as small as your fingernail. So just, and then obviously, being being safe with your body <laughs> having proper footwear so that you don't um 
injure your feet in case that was part of the question too. <laughs> Yeah, and don't push yourself. Um, just because you have chest waders on, you don't have to go into water that deep. I don't really like going above my knees ever. I start to feel a little unstable. Um, you can shuffle as well. If you're not sure if it's really murky, you can just kind of shuffle along instead of walking. Um, and the water. toads aren't toads aren't going to be in the super deep stuff anyway. I mean, and if, if they were, you wouldn't you wouldn't see them. So sticking to the shallows is is important for the surveys anyway. Perfect. Um, so Madeline asks, when should we mark several water bodies in a site and when do they become different sites? That's a great question. Um, so in one site, what you might have is a creek going into kind of a still offset pond so for that, I would have two separate water bodies in that one location. I would mark one here. Water body one would be the creek. And then I would do my information for that. And then water body two would be that pond because they're kind of markedly different habitats. Um, a different site, maybe, hmm. And when it walk, it's kind of fluid, honestly. And they're still, we're still trying to figure out, even with the DWR, who've been doing this for many, many years. Some biologists are saying like three separate ponds are three different sites. But if you can walk to them within five minutes, some biologists are saying they're three separate water bodies at the same site. So as long as you're just taking your kind of GPS markings, um, we should be able to filter into that, that big statewide database. Um, I wish I had a more solid answer for you, honestly, because that is a great question. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find, I used to have a picture um, in one of these presentations, but I don't think I have it. Um, but just use your imagination here. If you've been out in the Wasatch, you know, you could see this kind of like green, more green patch here of wet meadow um, and where it looks a little more yellow in the background might be more dry this time of year. And you have this pond. So in my mind, if there's, even if there's just inches of standing water in this more lush vegetation, the greener patches, I would consider this um, one and the pond itself two. And I would take the time to walk this whole perimeter where you have inches of water, because this all looks like potentially good habitat. And then there might be, you know, again, use your imagination here on the perimeter of this um, standing water, this little pond, maybe there are some shallows and some emerge ve emergent vegetation. So that's kind of a different habitat type. So I would consider there to be two features at, and this being one site. If that makes sense, and then if you're, you know, if you're hiking to a di another distinct location, I'd go ahead and do another field form. Perfect. Um, we have a couple questions from Jennifer about um, the the site specifically. So I'm going to throw in the chat the link to the uh, field trip locations, but I'll also just ask this question if there's any thoughts that either of you have. So um, they ask. Uh, on the day trips or camping trips, are they typically slow moving enough that we don't need to worry about keeping up with a group if we are slow hikers? And then also, can you elaborate on what longer hikes means, for example, at Boulder Mountain? Yeah. Um, we are not in a rush to get to these sites. Um, the day trips especially, they're definitely kind of at the whim of the group and we want to have a nice day. So you're probably going to be going out with a bunch of nature nerds, honestly. We'll be stopping, we'll be looking at flowers, birds. Did you hear that pika? So please don't ever feel like you're going to be holding up the group or you don't want to sign up because you like to take breaks. This is an inclusive um, group and I like taking everyone out. So please don't worry about that. The camping trips, uh, they're 
They can be a little more fast paced because we're with the DWR sometimes, the forest service, and they're just machines and they're off and they're going for, um, but you're always with me, so we can we'll just bring up the rear. It's okay. Please don't feel like you have to be a super hiker to come out with us because you don't have to at all. A longer hike, I would say um, like 30 minutes or more. And then I've tried to put the difficulty from one to five on some of those trips. Uh, a one will be probably off trail, but flat and not for a very long time between the car and the survey site. And then a five would be like Lake Lillian, Broads Fork, kind of an hour plus hike, maybe a thousand foot elevation gain. They're pretty hardcore. I, I think they're hard. Um, so I did try and highlight which ones are gonna be a little harder. Then I've taken people out and they're like, oh, this isn't hard. I'm, I do harder hikes than this. I thought that's really great, but I find this difficult. But we don't have any that are longer than, I think Maybird might be our longest one. And that's seven miles in, seven miles out. And I would call that a five hard, it's a long day. So, but if you have any questions on any of the sites, email me and I can direct you. Alltrails.com has a lot of really good information on there. They kind of rate it on their own system as well. And people will comment how they found it difficulty wise. Um, so yeah, email me if you have any questions about any sites, if you're a bit hesitant about signing up and I can kind of go into them individually in a bit more detail. Perfect. Um, Mariana asks, how often do you encounter a toad that has been affected by chytrid? Um, also, how can you tell if a site has been affected by it? Uh, if we have a historical positive, we assume it's still uh, positive now because there'd be no reason why the chytrid would disappear. Um, to tell if a toad has been affected by it, sometimes when the infection is quite bad, you see... Um, I have a, let me grab this visual real quick. The, the short answer is that it could be there and you would have no idea. That's true. You can't see it um, in itself, which is this tiny, tiny fungus. But sometimes when an amphibian has been like quite severely affected by it, the undersides will start showing this kind of red coloration, um, especially kind of their thigh area underneath their armpits. Um, they might be moving a bit slower when it's progressed very far in amphibia and they have this very classic like splayed out posture. Um, they're kind of too far gone then to save. But many toads may be building resistance to it now. It has been in their habitats for 20 plus years. And what we're hoping is the toads that are still persisting are getting this kind of natural immunity just through um, like quick evolution. So it's really hard to tell if it is there or not, but when it has progressed quite far in an amphibian, you'll see that red coloration, they have this very classic kind of splayed out posture. Thank you. Um, Zachary asks, what is the probability of actually finding toads while surveying? Uh, it depends where you are. Um, we have some sites where we know there are toads and we're kind of trying to keep an eye on the numbers and if the breeding is good. There are some sites um, among the Wasatch, they're in such low density, but we know they're there. So we did find a toad up at Broad's Fork um, once and we haven't seen her for a little while, but it's the, the harder, the longer you take to survey, the more likely you are to find toads. And I really try and remind people of this. If you've just hiked for an hour and a half up a very steep trail, don't just spend 15 minutes there, like really get in that grass, look around that lake. Um, you can go around a lake three times and on that third time, you might see the toad. They are masters of camouflage. They look like rocks, they look like dirt. Um, they love to hide from you. They like to make it really hard. So it just depends where you are. But I think we saw that number, we saw toads at 25 sites last year out of maybe 100. So casually 25% of the time. 
but it depends which site you're going to. They're, they're low density, so they're, they're tricky to find. Perfect. So Jeremy Brown asks, I thought Chara was a North American native algae. Is the term being used in a more general sense in this presentation to include other invasive plants, or is the algae non-native to Utah? I don't know if I have a detailed answer to that. I will have to look that up. I think um, it, it could be an issue. We could be talking about a nomenclature issue. Um, so common names are always problematic. A common name used out east could be for something very different um, out west. And I'm not as familiar with it out east. So um, I can try to get back to you on that. But yeah, we are, if you look at the, the image on the cheat sheet, um, the chara, which is, again, I'm just using common name and muskgrass. Um, we have a, a photo of the actual vegetation we're looking at. And I think there's several species covered under that common naming. Um, but we're looking, you'll also see the diagram. It's basically there's like a central stem and then there's a, a cylindrical whirl of vegetation that just like repeats. And so if you see that structure, we want to know. And if you are, um, well-versed in aquatic vegetation and you know more detail about specific species, I would love to hear about it. Okay, so Elva and Stella Meyer, um, uh, again, talking about the toad buckets. So they mentioned being interested in obtaining the different um, tools. So if you would like to reach out to Kaylee or Mary, um, they can work with you on that. That's, yeah, that sounds lovely. Um, and then uh, Louisa asks about wearing waterproof sandals, um, if that's a possibility or if it's not advised. So I don't advise it, but it, you know, do what I say, don't what I don't do what I do. <laughs> I, I often wear chacos um, and then have, you know, a pair of boots attached to my pack just in case I'll need them depending on what side I'm going to. If it's nice and warm out, it is really nice to wear chacos, especially in wet meadows and you don't have to worry about socks and shoes or holes in your waders. Um, but it's definitely a risk in case there's something sharp in there. Um, so we recommend closed toed for the record, closed toed shoes, but. Yeah, I, I only ever wear like big, thick, heavy rain boots, um, but you can wear chacos. A lot of the DWR biologists do. I think the only thing we don't recommend is those, I think they're called like canyoneering sneakers, maybe like shoes that have a lot of intricate folds and pockets because they're just really hard to clean afterwards and you just increase the risk of spreading pathogens with more like, intricate shoes, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and then also with this question, uh, Kyla or Kayla asks, what about snakes? Are they common in wetlands here? Uh, we do see snakes in Utah. The only venomous snake is the rattlesnake snake that we would have to be concerned about. I believe that to be true. Um, I have come across a rattlesnake snake three times since serving in Utah every single day, every single summer. Um, so not super common. And again, you just have to be smart around wildlife. You see a snake, just leave them alone. They're not interested in you if you're not poking and bugging them. So I recommend being aware and just constantly aware of your surroundings. And that goes for every kind of animal that you might meet out in the wilds of Utah, but they haven't been a concern or a hazard that I've had a real close encounter with. But yeah, the biggest... Have... Go on. Oh, I was just going to say, the biggest likelihood of you encountering them on this on these surveys would be if you decided to flip logs or woody debris. Um, so you could just choose not to do that unless you um, feel really comfortable doing that. And so, yeah. Um. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see. We have a couple of notes about the sandals as well. So Louise says, please be aware whether or not you're serving in a protected watershed. 
uh, such as Big and Little Cottonwood Canyons, mm. which are both protected. Um, in protected watershed, skin to water contact is not allowed. That is a great point. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then let's see. Okay, yeah, we have a question from Steph who asks if during camping trips, volunteers will have the opportunity to tag toads. That is at the discretion of the DWR. Um, I'm renewing, you have to have a certificate to conduct tagging on toads of any kind, because they're a state sensitive species. So I'm currently renewing mine and under my certificate, only I can tag the toads, but I believe under the DWR biologists, they can allow people to tag toads in their presence should they decide to. So it's kind of at the discretion of the state biologists that we will be with on the camping trips. Perfect. Um, that is all the questions that I see and we are at time. So if folks have any other questions come up as you get started, the contact information is here. And also um, keep an eye on our project page for resources, signups sheets, um, the recording to this video, and then also expect a follow up email with other resources as well to come soon. So Thank you all so much. Um, we hope you have a wonderful night and it's been just an absolute pleasure to spend this evening with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. We'll see you in the summer. <laughs>